church, and this we're kind of talking about different roles between men and women and the different, you said there were two sort of opinions of two different churches, one saying that men and women have different roles, and one saying mm-hmm. they were intercha- interchangeable. Mm-hmm. So where do you find yourself, and if there are different roles, what are they? Yeah, great question. Um, I actually don't call myself a complementarian or an egalitarian. I call myself a sacramentalist, and that's because nobody knows what that means. <laughs> <laughs> and that way you won't put me in a box. But um, honestly, I think, I think both those camps have blind spots. Um, I would say the complementarian church tends to focus so much on sex roles, but often when I ask people who call themselves complementarian, well, why did God even create male or female? Why? Was it just so we could do different things and he could tell half the population not to do certain things? I mean, is that why? And they, they don't have an answer, and I feel like there's kind of a missing the forest for the trees. Like we're so into what we can do and not do, but we haven't figured out why God made us the way we are. The egalitarians, on the other hand, I feel like they deny that there's any good and beautiful reasons between male and female. Again, why did God make us male and female if we're just to be interchangeable? I mean, why? Is it just for procreation? Is that it? And it really wasn't until I was in my 40s. And I grew up my whole life in the church. My parents were missionaries, went to a Christian school, working at a Bible college, right? You know, so I've, I've been in evangelical communities forever. And I'd never heard this before until I was in my 40s. And I became aware of something called theology of the body. And it's actually a compilation of sermons by John Paul II. And he's Catholic. We're evangelicals. We don't usually read Catholics, right? Um, and I remember when I read this, I was like, I mean, it seemed, it, there's something about it that resonated really deeply with me. And I remember going in, uh, it was one of the nice things about working at Moody is that I could talk to um, theology professors. And I, said, I remember asking, okay, hey, I'm reading this. And I wouldn't say who it was from, but I'd just describe the theology and be like, is, what do you think of that? And they're like, oh, that's good Trinitarian theology. And I'm like, huh, that's interesting because that's John Paul II. And, um, but basically, what I read that was just mind-blowing to me is that in Genesis 1.27, when it says that God created male and female, in his image, well, it says in his image he created them, male and female, he created them. So there's something about being created in God's image, something about God's image that is reflected in male and female. And I never thought about that before. Well, what is that? That male and female. Well, then you skip forward to... Uh, Genesis 2.24, and we, we read that the two became one flesh. And what I didn't realize is that theologians have long believed that that is meant to be a Trinitarian symbol, that as you have husband and wife, two very separate, different persons becoming one flesh, that that is a reflection of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three different persons existing as one essence. And all of a sudden, that put everything in a new light for me. Because now, is there difference within the Godhead? Yeah. I mean, God the Father has a very different role than God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Is there hierarchy in the Godhead? Yeah. You know, Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. Do you think of hierarchy as the main thing when you think of the Trinity? No. You think of love. You think of mutuality. You think of God's glorifying the Son, the Son's glorifying the Father, the Holy Spirit glorifies both. There's no competition in it. There's no hierarchy in that sense as we think of it because we think of it in a very fallen way. But you see in there that each glories in their unique role that they have within that trinity. But it's, it's one that is without oppression. It's one that is beautifully harmonious and is fruitful and life-giving. And then you, you go forward to, to Ephesians 5. And then we see that one flesh union is referenced again. But this time, the one flesh union is a reflection of Christ's relationship with the church. And so, really, marriage, I began to realize that marriage are the bookends of Scripture. Scripture begins with a wedding, it ends with a wedding feast, and it's the great metaphor to understanding everything in between. And so if you want to understand why marriage, why gender and sexuality is so under assault right now, this is the primary way we understand God. This is the primary way we understand how we relate to God. So, of course, Satan would be attacking it. So... To get back to your question, how does, that, how does that translate into roles and what we do? Well, I think first, it, okay, this is the point. 
when we understand the big picture and what we're meant to be as male and female, that becomes the primary. And then this, the roles, the gender roles, are really there just to preserve the integrity of that symbol that we're to reflect to the world. So in our church, our church is different. I'm Anglican. So um, in our church, women can actually preach and teach and do a lot of the, you know, can use their gifts in a variety of ways. What we can't do is perform the sacramental roles, as in um, officiating communion. We can never do that. Why? Well, because the person who's doing that, we would view that person as a stand-in for God, for, for Jesus. I mean, it's a Christ figure. And God is always masculine in relation to us. Because God always initiates, we always respond. That's why he is the bridegroom and we are the bride. And so those kind of sacramental roles would be reserved for a priest. So we don't have female priests for that reason, because that's a really important sacramental role. But there is a really beautiful thing in our church. And I think every church that's healthy has these, whether they're uh, official or non-official, but there's mothers and fathers of the church. And they're both so critically important. And you can probably even think of mothers of your church, women who are spiritual mentors for other women and who women look up to. And there's men, and, and I love it. There's times in our church where our pastor will say, we need to hear from, from the mothers of our church. And they'll come up and speak to all of us because sometimes we need to hear from that feminine voice. So there's a, a, a wonderful embracing of the difference, but this unity with distinction, real unity with distinction. And so um, probably a long answer to a simple question, but, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's an important one. Hello, friend. Hey, Ellie. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Gosh, our guys were so small. Uh, being in our moms in touch groups together and having the kids go through school together, through the life together, right? Mm -hmm. All those conversations about women, mm -hmm. I have to say it's so great to see this evolution mm -hmm. of how God has moved in your life. It's been amazing. And mm -hmm. I just am so grateful for that. Mm -hmm. How is, and my question, mm -hmm. Since you have really come into fruition about these in, in this way, mm -hmm. um, in these in, through your relationships now, through your awareness of gender, how have your relationships really evolved and changed? Um, the one I think of just right off the bat is is the relationship with my daughter. Um, I can honestly say when. If my daughter had been born when my sons were born, I would have nurtured her to be like my boys. I would have nurtured her to be strong and to be tough. And I would not have really valued her feminine. And I can remember, um, I can remember women who had, you know, other moms who had girls, and they would tell me about, for example, how they put on like different outfits ten times a day, and I'd be like, I would never put up with that, you know. <laughs> Like, way too much laundry? No, I don't think so. But what I didn't realize was how charming that was. And when Leah was born, it really was, um, you know, I kind of, God had begun to work in my heart, you know, and I began to become aware of some of these things. And she was so beautifully feminine in so many ways. And watching her grow up, and seeing how beautiful that feminine was, it was like I was discovering it, but rediscovering it for the first time in some ways. And she, from the very beginning, was, is one of the most, like she, can, she knows the emotions in our home, like right away, she knows immediately if somebody's upset. She'd be the first uh, to do that. When she would play with the boys, it was so funny because our, our boys are, the, my second child is seven and a half years older and then Nathan is 10 years older than Elia. And, um, so every now and then they would want to involve her in their play. And I, I remember when they would play with blocks, they would always build these, you know, skyscrapers and then they'd smash them. They always had to smash them. <laughs> Elia would take the blocks and would name them and they would all be talking to each other. 
And I began to see this and, and just realize it was just her feminine nature and how beautiful it was. And it brought this entire new dimension to our home. But it also began to, to awaken things in me because I realized that's me, but in my home that really wasn't valued. So I kind of kept it at bay. But when I saw how beautiful it was and God really used that experience in a really wonderful way, and it was just God's timing. I mean, again, if, I, if she had come earlier, I, I, I really do shudder to think how I would have nurtured her. Um, but that's one probably, when I think of, of a relationship, that's one that was just so profoundly affected by that. Hey, hey Beth. Um, thank you so much question to you is what or how would you advise 20 something year olds who are entering into leadership and rightly so mm -hmm. whether it's within the church context or in a business type setting that hadn't learned about what you found in your 20s or further so what would you advise boy I tell you it sure is nice if you're in an environment where the feminine is blessed and, and I guess this would just sort of be a challenge to the men. Um, because in some ways, we don't have the power to change that. Um, in some ways, we, we have. But I think for men to bless women is just so huge. Women cannot be the women that we're made to be if men aren't the men that they're made to be. I mean, it's just that simple. And, um, you know, that whole thing from the feminist movement of, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. That's not true. We need men. And men need us. And so, um, I mean, if I was starting out in my 20s, I really would look for an environment where there's that kind of value and, there's, and it's not a toxic environment because that's just, it's, it's just so damaging to your soul to be in those environments. And it's hard to be healthy when you're in those. I mean, it just is. I, you're angry and you're frustrated and you're hurt. And, and it's really very difficult. So, I mean, that would be part of it. Um, but I think, too, um, and this is going to sound really countercultural, but I think because of the way our culture tells us who we have to be, um, I see a lot of women, it, it's interesting. I, I read a study, there's a book called um, What Our Mothers Didn't Tell Us. It's written by a, a woman, Danielle Crittenden. I don't think she's a believer. But it's really interesting because she says that women have kind of bought, if, if you just go interview women on campuses today, they don't think they're feminists, but every single value that they express is feminist. You know, where the career is above the family. And I'm going to do this first before I consider having a husband. Um, and then she says what happens is you follow this career track and then you find out when, you, when you're in your late 20s, early 30s, wow, this really didn't fulfill me the way I thought it was going to. Because I think we do get fulfilled differently as men and women. And so we get half the way down the line and then we realize, oh, what I really want is maybe a family. And I think we haven't listened to the natural impulses inside of us. We've kind of pushed them down. And I'm not saying that's for everybody. I mean, some people are called to singleness. Some people are called. To, and I don't think there's a one size fits all. But I do think there's a, 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 a danger in our society um, to devalue motherhood. And I would say motherhood still, I mean, if you read scripture throughout, mothers are valued and what they do is valued and our culture is perverse that it doesn't value motherhood anymore. And so I would just say that's, that's not a biblical value. So be open to that and be open to the Lord what he's saying to you in that. So I am a father of three. I have a five-year-old son, a three-year-old daughter, and a one-year-old daughter. Oh, wow. And uh, the stories you're telling, stories of Janet, uh, a lot of the trajectory for how we treat each other as mm. men and women begins in childhood. And so as a parent and for the parents and the pre-parents in the room, how can we, what are some tips for raising our daughters and affirming their femininity mm -hmm. and raising our sons, affirming their masculinity, but also teaching them to affirm the, the feminine mm -hmm. values in the women in their lives. Anything you got. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I think the first is think about, I mean, really examine what your attitudes are towards the feminine and the masculine. Um, I mean, both of those are gifts from God. They're both beautiful and they're both wonderful. And I think we need to bless and affirm that. And, and we need to look at, okay, how have we been shaped maybe in our attitudes towards the masculine or the feminine? And how do we feel about it? Um, there is, there can be among men sort of that rah, rah, all macho, all whatever. And we have very imbalanced men in our culture. Um, and there's, there's almost a sense of, um, I think you can go, you, you, you can have a feminine caricature or a masculine caricature that are really distorted. Um, God is both masculine and feminine, right? I said he's masculine in relation to us, but that doesn't mean he's more masculine than feminine. He is, he's both. I mean, those are virtues that come from God. And so they're, they sh they're wonderful gifts that we should embody. But he is, I'd say bipolar, but I don't mean bipolar in that sense. But I mean, he, he embodies both masculine and feminine, and so do we. You know, and I think with children, um, obviously in proportion to their gender, but there needs to be a balance of masculine and feminine. A, a, a man that's all masculine and has no feminine qualities is no compassion, no gentleness. No, I mean, that's a scary man. Similarly, a woman who has no masculine qualities, who can't say no, who can't stand up, who has no will, that's very unhealthy. And so I think in our children to, uh, the attitudes that we have towards masculine and feminine, they'll pick up on. And so if, if we're not loving that and, and nurturing that in them, or if, too, we're not really allowing them to be, yeah, I think that exists for each of us along a spectrum of how much masculine and feminine, you know, each of us has. God made us unique. That's okay. But I think to really bless that, to really bless those gifts in them, bless them as men and as women, especially in your case, um, and catch yourself when you say something, you know, negative or, you know, you make those jokes about women or about men or whatever. I mean, it's not healthy for either gender, to be honest. Um, so I have a question about, um, what does the scripture say about, like, a man, uh, who may take on the role as, uh, like the stay-at-home dad, whereas the woman is the... Uh, kind of like the breadwinner in a sense. Um, does scripture say anything about like that kind of family dynamic? Well, I'm trying to think if there's any stay-at-home dads in scripture. I can't think of any. Um, but I think that question actually gets at something much deeper. And this is, this is why I call myself a sacramentalist. As a sacrament is really just a physical symbol that reveals a spiritual or a deeper reality. And our bodies are important. We live in a culture that says our bodies mean absolutely nothing, right? You can have a male body, but if you feel like you're a female, then you can become a female, right? There's no difference. There's no difference between male and female. So if you want to switch roles, if a mother, you know, if a father wants to be a mother, a mother wants to be a father, they can do that. And there's Nothing to that. That's actually rooted, I'm going to make this actually somewhat philosophical, but that's rooted, that, that whole idea, if you trace it back, you can, you can trace it back to a second century philosophy called Gnosticism. And essentially, what the Gnostics believed was that the physical world was bad and deceptive. And in fact, we have an entire creation narrative because God couldn't have created the physical realm because the physical is all bad, so God has to be a little bit bad, right? So God has a son, his son is evil, and his son creates the physical world. And so we're kind of trapped inside our bodies, but each of us have this divine spark inside of us. What does this sound like? We have this divine spark inside of us, and salvation comes from discovering your true self, which may be completely at odds with your body that might be deceiving you. All right? It's the transgender movement right there. It's all Gnosticism. The church... I mean, even if you look at the Nicene Creed, some of these early creeds of the church were actually written in part to combat Gnosticism. The Gnostics denied the incarnation of Christ because how could God become human? How could he take on an evil body? So they would deny that. It was a heresy of the church. Christians have never, ever accepted Gnosticism. Christians have always understood that the body 
is important and it speaks something, it says something, it's a walking theology, it shows us something about God. If you want to know something about the nature of what it means to be a man, look at your body. Look at your body, it tells you something. If you want to know something about the nature of what it means to be a woman, what's the essence of femininity? Receiving. That's what our body does. And so our bodies are important. You want to know if men can be equally mothers? Look at your body. Can you nurse? You know, now we know, science is telling us all sorts of things. That we know now that when a woman nurses a child, when you have that skin-to-skin -skin contact, that there's oxytocin is released, and there's this incredible bonding that happens with a child when a mother breastfeeds her child. A man can't do that. A man doesn't carry a child for nine months. And I want to say something that might be very offensive to our culture, but I think it's incredibly offensive for men to think that they can do what I can do as a mother. I don't think men can do it. I was made to be a mother. You were made to be a father. I can't be a father and you can't be a mother. And it's about time that we just embrace what God has made us instead of fighting it. And our culture is going insane, it's going nuts, and it's rejecting, it's rejecting the very common sense realities that are right in front of us. So, thanks for that question. Hi, right here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, when you talk about your friend, I think so many of our first ideas of who we are as, as women come from who our earthly fathers are. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a single mother of a daughter. And I guess my question is, how do I combat some of those negative feelings that she may be getting, even subconsciously, because her earthly father is not someone who's going to be encouraging her and her femininity by any means, and, and sees me as the as doing both roles? Mm -hmm. How do I kind of try and halt those hurts um, from not being kind of affirmed in that way? Mm -hmm. We're all going to be hurt. And the beauty to me of, of the gospel is that God redeems. And so we have imperfect situations that weren't God's design, they weren't his plan, and yet God redeems. And so I, I love the portions of scripture that talk about God being the father to the fatherless. And and even as a single person, I think we can experience God. We can experience, you know, it's interesting to me that John Paul II wrote so profoundly about marriage because he was never married. He was committed celibate. And he talked about skipping past the shadow of the real and really entering into that cosmic marriage that we have, you know, with Jesus, that mystical marriage, not cosmic, mystical marriage of, of with God and skipping past that reality. And I think that or that shadow of it that we have with our earthly marriage. Um, I think the same way with our children. You know, they can experience when they don't have a father, that profound relationship with Jesus, with God being their father. And I, I think as, as mothers, single mothers, can encourage that, you know, to really, that God is your father. You know, that's your heavenly father. That's, that's the true vision of what it means to be a father, the way that he loves us. Um, but it's, it's hard. I mean, that's, I mean, I've never been a single mom. I, I've been a married mom, and that was hard enough. You know. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think the church needs to do a lot to support single moms, and I think what you do is amazing, and that God supplies you. I mean, it says he'll supply us with all we need, but it's a huge, huge task, and, uh, but I do believe we serve a God that can do that. Yeah, um, well, I think the Me Too movement, in many ways, you know, there might be a variety of opinions on it. I, I think in many ways it was, it's been really positive. I think we're living in a culture where women have a voice that they haven't had for a really long time. Um, 
can it, you know, can it be abused? Everything's abused. So of course it will be, and it has been, and I'm sure you know it will continue to be. But I think we are living in a moment where women have a chance to speak into um, the ways that they've been oppressed in culture and abused. And I think that's a good thing. I, I think the Me Too movement can be very positive. And I think as a church, it's good to embrace that, the positive parts of it. Um, feminism, um, the thing that's hard about feminism is that it's an ism. It's an ideology. And you can't I extricate yourself from the ideology. I've, I've seen, you know, there, there's this Jesus feminism that's really popular now. Uh, if you've read Sarah Bessie's book called Jesus Feminist or whatever. Um, and on the call cover of the book it says the ra just the radical notion that women are people too. So I guess if you're not a feminist you don't think women are people too. I mean it's, it's propaganda. I, it really is. That's not what feminism is. It never has been. It really is rooted in the idea that men and women are interchangeable. And there is no essential difference between men and women. And that's just not a biblical message. And so I think it's very hard to embrace feminism because it's already been defined. So we keep trying, I think, in the church to co-opt these, these cultural terms. And you can't. It already has a definition. It already has a philosophy and an ideology. Um, and even if you look at, I mean, I do it in the book. I kind of walk through the whole history of feminism and how it's progressed. But I would say when you go from there's four waves of feminism now. If you go from the second wave to the fourth wave of feminism, they're all rooted in a rejection of motherhood, a rejection of womanhood. Um, and so I, th I think that's really difficult. I think we need to look at biblical womanhood. You know, what does that really mean? Now, sometimes even that word biblical womanhood has gotten <laughs> um, co-opted in a way and meant to mean something that's kind of a caricature of womanhood. Um, but I think to really look at what, what does that mean? You know, what does scripture really mean when it talks about womanhood? Um, that that's a better way of thinking of it than, than feminism. But there may be some feminists if you want to take me on. I mean, it's <laughs> <laughs> Julie, uh, the Lord has equipped you in, in a specific Well, we have a perfect marriage, so. <laughs> <laughs> marriage has been hard for us. I mean, I'll just be honest. I mean, when I, especially going through those stages of not even knowing who I am as a woman, it's hard to then know who you are as a wife. And honestly, I have one of the most long-suffering and loyal husbands on the planet. <laughs> and so he stuck in with me through that. Um, when, I mean, I was probably very difficult to live with. Um, and so I'm really blessed in that way. And love covers a multitude of sins. Um, and I think that's a lot of marriage, is <laughs> love covering a multitude of sin. Um, but I think this is something that um, I think it's hard to be a wife and not really embrace the feminine because there's a, a receptivity to your spouse that you need to have. And I think I was afraid to do that for a long time because I was afraid that Neil was going to dominate me in some way. And I didn't want to be dominated. And so I would put up the, those walls and those barriers. That's still hard, you know? I mean, that's an impulse that you're used to um, that's hard to, to let go of. 
Um, but I will say, we are, we just actually celebrated our 31st um, wedding anniversary. I mean, it's back in the summer, but I mean, we've been married 31 years, which um, we got married when I was 15. <laughs> um, but that's, we've grown so much. I mean, when I look back on where we were at when I was 20 years old and we got married and, and where I am now, I mean, it's, God has taken us on an incredible journey. And I'm so grateful that we didn't throw in the towel because it is so worth it to work through that and to have 31 years under your belt and to know each other as well as we do. And, um, and we're still working at it, you know? But I think I'm trying to be a better wife and he's trying to be a better husband. And, um, and this past summer we actually did something we've never done before and now I'm like, why didn't we do this earlier? Um, we went to Italy for 10 days. We did an extended vacation without kids, and it was amazing, absolutely amazing. And, and I really, I, I said to him, I'm like, this was more fun than our honeymoon. And it was, it really was, because we had had that depth, we have that depth of relationship now, and we so enjoyed each other. Um, but it really is allowing God to mold you so that you fit. Um, and so I'm very grateful for that. We have time for one more. So if you have a question, this is your, your opportunity. I know the answer to this is probably going to be you know, fairly uh, simple, but I have a 29 year old daughter, and early on when she was born, First thing she gave me was a, a book, and it says it was titled "She Calls Me Daddy," and it made me see from the very start the influence I could have, either positively or negatively. And I, I like to think my relationship with my 29-year-old daughter is really strong. Uh, she is a relationship that I think is very good. But as My guess is you, you, you've probably built a lot of those things into her already. From loving her, and caring for her, and I, I'm guessing from what you've said that you have a close relationship with her. And that is, is so huge. Um, we're, we've just entered that stage of, of having adult children. Um, so we're learning, you know, as we go. But I have noticed... Um, that they still need our love and our care. It's like you never stop being a parent. And so I think you, you keep being a father and she'll still need to hear from you. It, it's funny though, like um, my one son is fond of saying, mom, you don't have to say it, I have the tapes. You know? <laughs> and it's true, he has the tapes. And those tapes have been recorded. You spent years recording those tapes. And if they're, they're tapes of blessing and affirming and you know, those will play in their heads even after you're gone. Um, if there are things that need to be said or rectified, though, it's never too late. And I know we've had things like that with our adult children after they're 20 years old of being able to say, I'm really sorry for that and owning it. And it was huge. And it's amazing how much restoration can happen even later. And so... I don't know if that's your situation, but there might be others that have those things that need to be said, need to be reconciled, need to be, it's never too late. Julie, we're going to have one more question over here. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, is that one? Not, not a deep theological, you know. <laughs> no, I, first of all, I think you just exposed that we have a lot to learn hmm. in this whole thing and, and want to learn. So my question comes just feels the church has stepped in a lot of wrong directions in this. What's the one 
What's the one thing, it's, it's a general question and churches are so different, but what's the one mistake the church is making in this area and how do we reverse it? Or what steps do we begin to take to see that change or do it better? One thing. I I will just say I think the church whether you're egalitarian, complementarian sacramentalist, whatever I I do think those things are important I do, and I don't mean to minimize those theology is really important how we view things is really important Um, but I think every church the men in the church, the leadership in the church, needs to recognize that there's gifting in women. And they need to be blessed and affirmed. And I think women, we naturally, I mean, just like we do from the time we're little girls and we want to hear affirmation from our fathers, the spiritual authorities in our life, we want to hear affirmation from them. And it's huge. And I tell you, one of the most powerful things, and maybe you'll want to do this sometime in your church, um, one of the most powerful things that I've ever experienced is I've had, where we've had all the women just sit in a circle and the men to come behind them and to even confess ways, the misogyny, you know, ways that maybe they've done that against women, but then to lay hands on them and to just pray and bless and affirm women. Um, I remember, I used to do a lot of worship leading And I'll never forget the first time, um, our church, again, we do weird things like um, anoint people with oil. (laughs) But but I remember the first time that I was leading worship, and a a, a priest actually came and anointed my forehead with oil and blessed me before I led worship. I almost started crying. I was kind of a mess when I went to lead worship, because I had never, I had fought so much with pastors, because they they don't know what to do with a strong woman half the time or a gifted woman. And to have a pastor bless me in something and bless me in leading was huge. It was absolutely huge. And I think there's just a great dearth of that in the church. And I think women are hungering for it, hungering to be blessed and affirmed as women, but also as the giftings that God's given us.